everyone today we're going to be talking about carbohydrates and foods and this is a two-part video series and rest assured if you ask questions I might make a third or fourth part but uh, we're going to talk a lot about just uh, introduction to some of the chemical structures of carbohydrates that we see in food products so that we can understand more about um, the context of applications so at the end of this video, you'll be able to describe the chemical structure of carbohydrates in foods, including monodi and polysaccharides, starches, and cellulose. And we'll discuss the structure of other compounds that are classed with carbohydrates from a dietary perspective, such as dietary fiber, cellulosic and hemicellulosic materials, lignans, and polysaccharide gums. And we're going to take it from a really high level. Um, again, most of the students who are taking this program at Niagara College haven't taken a lot of um, complex organic chemistry. And so... I want to introduce you to the chemical concepts, but really think a lot about the outcomes because I am training product developers and understanding the structure helps you understand the function and understanding the function is how you create delicious and high quality food products. So carbohydrates, this is from a pretty old slide deck, but uh, um, I'm, I've done a few updates uh, to bring it up to the modern standards. So, Carbohydrates, when we think about carbohydrates, honestly, in the food sector, there's a lot of controversy because um, in the past decade or so, there's been a lot of backlash towards carbohydrates and their role in um, chronic disease, such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Um, honestly, carbohydrates are being uh, targeted as really negatives within the food sector, but they have such a really critical and important role in terms of uh, food products. So much of our modern agriculture is based off of production of carbohydrate foods, wheat and corn and, and so on, and um, much of our global economy is based off of carbohydrate trade. Um, honestly, much of North America was developed because of the potential uh, of um, sugar plantations within the southern United States and into the Caribbean and uh, um, South American, Central American region. So, Carbohydrates have influenced global history for many, many periods, and they're so vital to so many food products. Bread, which is one of the largest staple foods, pastas, beer, dessert products, confectionery, all of these are reliant on carbohydrates, and to, a, uh, to more of a stealth-based uh, impact, more or less carbohydrates are impacting on every food category that's out there. So what are we talking about when we're talking about carbohydrates? The most simple uh, form that we need to think about is sugar. And sugar is a carbohydrate. And what we're looking at here in this slide are the uh, chemical structures of some of the most common sugars that we find in food products. So we've got glucose, we've got maltose, we've got fructose and sucrose. And what we notice here is um, very consistently we've got in general, almost all of our food sugars are going to be six carbons. We can't see it here, but there's a carbon at this corner. One, two, three, four, five, and six. There's six carbons in these sugars, but you're likely looking over here and saying, wait a second, that can't be six carbons. Well, it is actually based off of this monomer, this sort of building block. I often say, think of them as sugars are polymers. Think of them like Lego blocks. That six carbon block is the most common block that you'll find, but sometimes you'll find them in these double formats, disaccharide formats, with two sugars linked together. In this case, it's maltose, and maltose is very common as the breakdown product of um, malting for the production of beer or enzymatic degradation of starch for the production of glucose syrups or high fructose corn syrups. Fructose down here, you're likely saying, wait a second, that's not the same shape. Well, one, two, three, four, five. Wait a second, there are six carbons here. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six carbons still. It is just the difference in how it's looping back on itself in terms of forming that ring structure. 
this is a five carbon ring, but it's still a six carbon sugar. And so that's important to note. Uh, take, a, uh, take a look at this uh, disaccharide over here. That would be sucrose, which is our most common table sugar, granulated sugar. And it is a disaccharide where we've got a glucose monomer and a fructose monomer combined together. And that's important to note. We'll talk in the second slideshow about glycemic index in food products. Um, sucrose has half the glycemic index of glucose. Glycemic index, as you can guess, is measuring glucose level in the blood. In physiology, human physiology, glucose is the preferred sugar. We can take fructose and we can convert it over to um, acetyl groups that can be uh, used for energy production, but glucose is the preferred, the preferred energy source for uh, muscle movement, for brain function, for uh, the building block of energy pretty much in every single cell. So, as I mentioned before, each of those sugars comes from the same chemical formula, but it has a different structure. Glucose is C6H12O6. Fructose, C6H12O6. Can you guess what galactose is? Ah, surprise, C6H12O6. Now, when we saw sucrose in there, sucrose, as you remember, going back, is a disaccharide. So that would be C12H24O12. Just multiplying everything by two. Now, moving forward, as I mentioned before, carbohydrates are often polymers, and starch is a polymer. So we're taking glucose molecules and we're stacking them together in long chains, and that is what's forming our starch polymer. Now you'll notice here we've got long chains in long lines, but we've also got these branch points, and the, the branching starch is slightly different than the unbranched starch. We've got different starch forms. We've got amylose and amylopectin. We'll talk about that in a, in a few slides moving forward. But main takeaway from this slide is glucose and other, um, to a lesser extent, other monosaccharides can form these polymer chains. And those polymer chains in some forms, are making starch. And starch, as we know, is an incredibly important ingredient in food products. So what is the difference between these uh, two different branching forms? Well, in the case of amylose, we've got alpha-1-4 glycosidic bonds. Now let's, let's walk through here. Uh, we saw those glucose molecules before. So we've got carbon-1, 2, 3, 4. Alpha 1, 4. So we're connecting between the, the 1 carbon in a glucose and the 4 carbon in a glucose with a glycosidic bond. And so that alpha 1, 4 glycosidic bond is what we see in amylose. And alpha 1, 4 just happens to make nice long linear molecules, nice long linear polymers of glucose. That linearity means that those um, amylose uh, amylose polymers like to pack flat with one another. And this is important from a, a starch functionality perspective. Lots and lots of amylose in your starch, it's going to be um, very dense and it's going to be able to retrograde. We'll talk about what retrogradation is, but think about starch. We are heating it with water. That starch molecule becomes unorganized. And that's where we're getting gelation and pasting occurring, that thickening process that you see in cooked starch. That thickening process can reverse on cooling and storage. And amylose, because it's a nice, long, linear molecule, it is much more prone to reorganizing effectively. Flat things will pile up, and uh, it's energetically more favorable for those molecules to reorganize. Whereas amylopectin down here, we, we see we've got those alpha-1-4 linkages there, but we've also got these alpha-1-6 links. So that's the one carbon, and then we've got the six carbon down here. We've got a glycosidic bond between those two. Amylopectin just happens to be a highly branched starch. And 
this is something that's worth noting when, when reaching out to a starch supplier, how much amylose versus how much amylopectin is in my starch. Amylopectin, as you can guess, is branched. It's got all of these um, uh, branch points, which makes it more difficult to organize. And as such, amylopectin starches do not retrograde as readily and have better freeze-thaw and better cold storage capabilities uh, in general. Something else, we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but uh, large, long chains of starch have really good pasting capability, but they do not hold up well under shear and under a lot of agitation. They can start to break down if you have too much mechanical action, and so you may need smaller starch. So think about this. What, we, what we're seeing here, when we say amylose, we see four glucose molecules here, but honestly, many amylose or amylopectin molecules could be thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of glucoses long. It's just unpractical to show it within the diagram here. Something else that's worth noting is that sugars are what are known as chiral compounds. And when it comes to what a chiral compound is, I often say to my students when they're in class in person, raise your hands, put your hands together. Your hands are like chiral compounds. If you think about the molecule, and admittedly the, the molecules that are in the hands are actually amino acids, but uh, that's the graphic that I have here. Sugars biologically are always made in the same mirror image, but when we start to synthetically make them in um, chemical fermentations and so on, you can have the opposite sugar forming. We have to think about the biological sourcing on those sugars and the fact that they're all going to be one chirality in normal, normal food products. So let's just jump back to monosaccharides here. Monosaccharides, some of the common ones that we find in foods include glucose, galactose, and fructose. And I don't uh, I don't want my students at, um, at the college to worry about memorizing the structures. These are the sorts of things that you can look up quite readily. What I want you to focus on is why would I be using a monosaccharide within a food product? Um, where can I find this information quite readily? What sorts of food products are we seeing these in? So glucose, very common from corn syrups. What's great about or glucose is that it doesn't like to crystallize very readily. Galactose is quite common in milk-based sugars. Lac lactose is the disaccharide, and um, glucose and galactose disaccharide is lactose sugar. Cleaved, it forms a, uh, the galactose sugar, and in many cases, people who have lactose insufficiency are unable to, uh, they don't have the enzyme within their gut, uh, within their intestines, to cleave the glucose and galactose from each other, and so they need to have it either cleaved by bacterial fermentation or the inclusion of a lactose enzyme in the food product to make it tolerable for uh, consumption. Galactose, um, or pardon me, lactose, or lactase insufficiency within the gut is a very common um, enzymatic insufficiency. Most, most children lose it in, um, in childhood after uh, stopping consuming uh, much of the milk. So it's something that product developers do need to be aware of. Fructose is a very common sugar within uh, fruits and to a lesser extent in vegetables. It has a bit of a negative connotation when it's added as uh, high fructose corn syrup. But um, fructose is a, a notable sugar because it has extremely high sweeten sweetening capability, but it's unable to brown in Millard reaction. We'll talk about that in a few moments here. Now, when... When looking up chemical structures, honestly, there's all sorts of different ways that you're going to see these chemical structures. All of them are correct. And there's not, uh, again, I want to be focused on outcomes basis. I don't want to, I don't want to overwhelm people with a huge amount of chemistry, knowing that most of the students who are taking the course haven't taken a lot of high school chemistry. 
oftentimes what we will see is what's called a fissure projection. This is where they're breaking open that ring and laying it out flat. And when I was in my undergrad, we had to sit and memorize all of these. And nowadays I'm like, I don't want you to memorize this. I want you to, I want you to be able to go out and apply your knowledge. This is the sort of thing that you should look up in a book so that you're not making a mistake and you're not creating an error. Again, which are the most common sugars that we're going to see? All of these theoretically are possible, but we very rarely see some of the sugars like allose and altrose and glulose and idose. We very rarely see them. They are physically, logically possible, but most plants, most um, plants are really the predominant source of carbohydrates. Humans are capable of doing some, some, uh, fabrication of glucose, but honestly, we really, we really get most of it from the diet. The key difference here is the orientation. Which direction are those hydroxyl groups facing within the uh, six carbon ring? That's really the key difference in these all those sugars. Now, all those, er, this is what's called a Hayworth projection, and that's that ring structure. And we do count off the carbons in that ring structure in a clockwise fashion starting at that um, oxygen within the ring structure. So, but the challenge is if you've got a, a disaccharide or a polysaccharide, oftentimes you'll have to flip this Hayworth projection and it will be backwards. And that's why, again why I don't want people to get overwhelmed by all of these different projections. Do study more chemistry, do learn more, but I want you to get past this and move on to the um, applications and functionality of sugars first and then keep on learning more chemistry and there's so many more resources that I can share with you but let's get to let's get to applications now this one is important to think about we talked about how glucose forms a six carbon ring and fructose forms a five carbon ring but both of them are six carbon sugars what's the difference is where is that Oh, when it comes to forming the ring. And in the case of glucose, it's, it's an aldehyde group where that O is that forms the ring. And in the case of fructose, it's a ketone group. There's, the oxygen is still there in a double bond to carbon, but in the case of fructose, it's in a ketone group and it's embedded in at the second carbon, not the first carbon. And that's what's differentiating to be able to make that uh, circular or ring structure within this sugar itself. This is important and, and we'll talk about the importance of this when it comes to Miller Browning. Only aldose sugars are capable of participating in Miller Browning. Ketose sugars like fructose do not participate in Miller Browning and I have seen this occur where uh, let's say I'm a food product developer and I'm like you know what? Fructose doesn't have a glycemic index. Fructose has a really high sweetening power. So calorie for calorie, I can get the same sweetening by using about half the amount of sugar and they'll put it into a baked good like a cookie. And then that cookie never browns and it sits there pale, 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 like uh, the palest uh, shortbread. And meanwhile, they want a brown, crunchy texture. It doesn't happen with fructose because it's a keto sugar and it will not participate in Miller Browning. That's an important thing to note. Now, we talked about monosaccharides. Let's jump into disaccharides. We're starting to build out these two sugar molecules. So the most common ones that we see in food products, let's talk about sucrose. That is a glucose and fructose with an alpha 1,2 glycosidic bond. Maltose is glucose and glucose with an alpha 1,4 glycosidic bond. Lactose is galactose and glucose with a beta 1,4. Beta 1,4 just implies that it's not in a flat line, that it is in this linear um, stacked form. So these are very common. Why do I name the glycosidic bonds? Well, when it comes to the enzymes that break these down, the enzymes are very specific to different glycosidic bond types. And so it's worth noting that when you're selecting for an enzyme to cleave different sugars, you may need a different enzyme for a different application. Are there trisaccharides? 
So mono would be mon one, di would be two. Trisaccharides, absolutely there are trisaccharides. One of the most uh, fun trisaccharides out there is raffinose, and it is a galactose, glucose, and fructose, and it is very commonly found in beans. The challenge is that we in our, in our intestines do not have enzymes to break this down. However, bacteria do have the enzymes to break it down. And the bacteria in our large intestine is quite capable of breaking this down and converting it into exometabolites of different organic acids and carbon dioxide and methane. And that means you uh, eat beans and then you fart. <laughs> I have a teenager and she is going to kill me when she knows that I said fart in a YouTube video. There are other trisaccharides. Maltotriose is a breakdown product from starch. And if you are in the malting process, let's say you're making beer, maltotriose is not uncommon. So again, in quick summary, monosaccharides have one sugar, disaccharides two. Oligosaccharides are two to ten sugars. And polysaccharides have greater than ten. I gave you one more. Um, this would be an oligosaccharide with four sugars. And this is a stachyose. Stachyose is also one of those um, not easily digested sugar, but it's easily fermented by uh, bacteria within the intestine. And stachyose is commonly found in beans as well. And many plant breeders have been interested in reducing the amount of uh, raffinose and stachyose expressed in uh, traditional bean cultivars to try and improve the digestibility and the palatability for consumers. So less gas, more bean deliciousness. As I mentioned before, glycosidic bonds, they're important to note. So alpha implies that it's along the plane, and these are uh, sugars that are, or uh, poly, uh, polymers, pardon me, that are going to lie flat. And beta implies that it's below the plane, so it's stacking one on top of another. We're jumping into cellulose here. Cellulose is a polymer, and we've got beta 1 for. We don't have really good enzymes in our guts that break down alpha 1 4 or alpha 1 6 bonds in starch. We really can't break down cellulose, and cellulose therefore becomes what we call dietary fiber. Dietary fiber implies we can't digest it and therefore we excrete it in our feces. Mm. <laughs> so, oh, I brought this up before. Reducing sugars imply that there is an open aldehyde group that can participate in melid reaction. So in the case of maltose, maltose can participate because it, it, what's interesting is it has one one open aldehyde group that can participate. The second aldehyde group can't participate, but at least one of the aldehyde groups can in the case of maltose. In the case of sucrose, what's happening is that it's not actually the sucrose that's participating, it is the breakdown of the sucrose that's participating. And so it's the glucose. Fructose doesn't have an aldehyde group, it has a, key, it has a ketone group. But the breakdown of the sugar within the food product, the freed glucose, can participate in melid reaction. So just in quick summary, we've got that aldose versus ketose structure in our sugars. Are there other combinations that can occur? We talked about cellulose. We talked about it briefly, that we've got um, that alpha-1,4 glycosidic uh, bond and uh, we can't break it down. There are others, other starch-like polymers that are out there. Not all of the starch-like polymers or, or cellulose-like polymers are truly cellulose. Some of them are other carbohydrates. And so this is beta-glucan. Beta-glucan is a polymer that's found in oats and barley. And it is a beta-1,3 branched glucose. And we don't have the enzymes to break down beta-1,3. Beta-glucan is an incredibly important um, dietary fiber source in oats and barley because it is one of the dietary fibers that has a lot of uh, capability of reducing 
up. Blood cholesterol, because it, 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 it's a soluble fiber and it sweeps out uh, bile acids during digestion and excretes them in the feces, therefore uh, reducing the, the cycling of bile acid for the synthesis of cholesterol within the, within the liver. Beta-glucan can interfere with brewing. And so there are certain brewing adjuncts where you can add enzymes to break down beta-glucan to increase the filterability of the product and increase the amount of uh, fermentable sugars. But in general, we can't digest beta-glucan. What else do we have here? Oh, we've got hemicellulose. This is, this is interesting. It's not cellulose. Cellul cellulose, as we recall, is a polymer of just glucose. And in this case, hemicellulose in many cases, can be all sorts of different sugars. Here we've got uh, xylose, mannose, glucose, and galactose in a structure. And honestly, there are all sorts of different hemicellulose structures that are out there. One last one that we've got here is pectin. This looks like sugar, but it's actually galacturonic acid. Many of the organic acids that are out there are the fermentation products of sugar and as such they are just um, structurally um, slightly different from a glucose structure in this case we've got an acid group organic acid group here instead of the um, carbonyl group that was in the sugar so honestly what we've got here in pectin you've got a polymer of galacturonic acid Pectin can have different amounts of methylation within that polymer. And so down here, you see what's called meth uh, methoxylated galacturonic acid. And different pectins have different ratios of how much methoxylation is occurring. In some cases, they're low methoxy pectin, LM pectin. And in other cases, they are high methoxy pectin, high methoxy HM pectin. And it indicates how these um, different gels are going to form. Um, low methoxypectin just happens to participate better in, um, uh, what's it called? Divalent salt bridging. So just like forming, forming gels across proteins, these can also participate in gelation using uh, calcium salts, like calcium chloride or calcium sulfate. So I think... Something else that's worth noting, in, in the case of dietary fiber, dietary fiber from a nutrition perspective implies that it is a food component that is extruded in the feces and not digested. And so there are other components within foods that are often associated with, um, with cellulose. We mentioned hemicellulose. Those are um, polymers of mixed monosaccharides. There's also something called lignin, and lignin is often, from a molecular perspective, associated with cellulose because it's often found in plant cell walls, and cellulose is a major component of plant cell walls from a, from a structural perspective. Hemicellulose, or pardon me, lignin, is sort of like uh, the glue that sticks the cells together, and they are not true carbohydrates. They are steroidal compounds, to be quite frank. Um, lots of different uh, ring structures going on within these compounds. When I say steroids, I don't mean like they're going to cause anabolic steroids and you eat uh, lignin and suddenly you are strong and muscular, but it's just from the uh, molecular structure that we see here. Lots and lots of different uh, ring structures within the organic chemistry. Long story short, lignin is a dietary fiber, but it is not a carbohydrate. And you can see very clearly we do not have that uh, six or uh, six carbon ring structure that is so common in a carbohydrate. I, um, I often am asked the question, are there other sugars that have five or seven um, carbohydrates? And yes, there are uh, what are called ribose sugars that are five carbons. There are heptulose sugars that are seven carbons, but they're reasonably, um, they, from a food science perspective, they're not really very common and we don't worry about them. 
from a biochemistry perspective, ribose sugars are very common in DNA. Um, but honestly, it's not going to be a priority from a food science perspective. The one, the one exception, a long, long time ago when they used to do uh, urine testing, people would uh, eat a lot of avocados because there's a lot of heptulose sugar, there's seven carbon sugar, and it would uh, fool the, the um, blood sugar and the urine sugar testing that was used in military screening. And people would eat a lot of avocados thinking that if they had enough heptulose sugar excreted in their urine, they would be told they have diabetes and therefore ineligible for the military con uh, conscription. And uh, modern testing methods are far more sophisticated than that. So don't think that you can eat avocados and skip out of, uh, skip out of your physical. So I think that's it for this video. And I have a second video coming up talking more about the function. We've talked about the structure. Let's get into the function. I think this is where the, the more fun part is when it comes to understanding carbohydrates. Yes, this is it. So ask more questions and we'll see you in part two.